Your obedience means nothing. Get over it. You want to say, well, what, what do we do? What do we do with obedience? Obedience is one thing. You just yield to the Spirit. That's it. You just yield. You just yield, and then you yield again, and you yield again. And you ask Him to take control of your life. You ask for Him to power your life. You say, well, what stops me from, from, from yielding? Unconfessed sin. God will use a short vessel, tall vessel, skinny vessel, fat vessel, crippled vessel, but there's one thing he won't use, and that's a dirty vessel. He just wants you to be clean before him. Just walk in the Spirit, and you'll put to death the deeds of the flesh. Sometimes I hear messages. I heard a message three weeks ago. A guy went on for 45 minutes talking about how we need to obey this and do this and be this way and be that way. And then at the end, he threw a five-minute caveat, or maybe not even that long, three minutes to say, oh, yeah, and by the way, you can't do this yourself. You have to do it in the power of the Spirit, as if that kind of made it better. Let me tell you, that last three minutes that he talked about walking in the Spirit, that is the message. The other four, 45 minutes of ranting and raving over obedience was the caveat. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got to get back to walking in the Spirit. And I'll tell you what, if that's it, we find ourselves not judging each other at that point. Obedience oftentimes is the basis, is the feedbed for all the judging we do. Because we have a wrong view of what it means to be obedient. We think if we just, you know, we're going to cooperate. That's a great word that we like to use from time to time in theology. I have to cooperate with the Spirit. No, you don't. Your cooperation isn't necessary. What's necessary is your yielding. Let me get into this a little bit. It is God who is rock solid in our relationships. There's a hymn, an old, old hymn called I Am the Lord's. I wrote it down here this morning. I wanted to read this to you because I think it's so powerful. It says, I am the Lord's, O joy beyond expression. O oh, sweet response to the voice of love divine. Faith's joyous yes to the assuring whisper. Fear not, I have redeemed you. You are mine. I think sometimes we doubt our salvation, don't we? So we ramp up our obedience to prove to ourselves that we really belong to Jesus. Nothing could be more insidious than that. Right now, in your own heart, if you know that one day you profess Christ and ask Him to come into your life and forgive your sins and make you into the person that you want Him, that He wants you to be, that is your assurance of salvation. That is all there is. There is nothing more. He takes it from there. And your job is just to yield to the Spirit on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. That's why Jesus looked over Jerusalem. He said, I can do no mighty things here in Nazareth because of their unbelief. And folks, we have a lot of unbelieving believers today. And I probably am the chief of sinners here at times. It is so humbling to know. And even Bridges, who wrote the book on these acceptable sins, wasn't talking about trying to stop sinning. I believe that what he was at at the heart of his book was that we would walk in the Spirit in order to put the deeds of the flesh to death. Judgmentalism comes from your understanding that God might not be powerful enough to judge fairly. So I should probably get involved. You know, I... I don't know all there is to know about theology. I do know that from a humorous point of view, Steve Martin said this, comedian, he says, before you criticize a man, walk a mile in his shoes. That way, when you do criticize him, you'll be a mile away and you'll have his shoes. <laughs> well, we needed a little humor break there. Now that isn't the kind of attitude Jesus was talking about, but Jesus does paint a funny picture for us here. In Matthew 7, of a person walking around with a plank of wood in his eye, trying to take a speck out of his, out, of his, out of his brother's eye. 
This is a, a picture of someone who has issues in his or her own life but condemns others for the issues they have. I want to talk about my first point this morning, judgmentalism. Let's take a look at that. I want to talk about two things here, a warning and a, and a clarification. First of all, it says, don't judge or you too will be judged. That's a warning. To judge others is a dangerous thing. Only God is fit to judge. So if we judge others, we take the place that only God can take. And I, I have to tell you, that's pride, that's superiority. And, and, and that's, uh, that's not right. Secondly, he talks about a clarification. He says, when Jesus says, don't judge, let's clarify what he's saying. He isn't saying, don't have an opinion. That's impossible, because we all have opinions that, that, about things that others say and do. John Stott, great theologian from England, says it this way, Jesus does not tell us to cease to be human by suspending our critical powers, which help us to distinguish us from animals, but to renounce the presumptuous ambition to be God by setting ourselves up as judges. And then he closes with this. We're still allowed to tell right from wrong as we see it. Okay? So now we have a clarification. He's not talking about having an opinion here. In verses 3 through 5 here he says, we're going to see that Jesus is condemning a different kind of judging. It's the kind which really isn't interested in the well-being of the other person. The type of judging where we look at something or someone we think is in the wrong, and it makes us feel good that we had that opinion or that judgmental spirit. We say things like, I'm surprised that he didn't or didn't do such and such. Or why is she doing that? Why is she wearing that? Why is she eating that? And it makes us, it makes us feel good to have found this weak spot in the other person because it makes us feel bigger and better. Boy, am I describing politics today or what? But at the end of the day, we're really not bothered about the person's well-being. We're only interested in the good feeling we get when we have discovered their fault. And boy, does it feel good when we've found something wrong with them because that makes us feel better about ourselves. That's judgmentalism. I think we can have an opinion. We all had opinions. That's why we wear the clothes we wear, because we, they hope we, they match. <laughs> Nothing's worse than you walking into church and someone walks up and you say, do you think that shirt really goes with his pants? <laughs> now, that might happen at the house where, the, where your wife is telling you guys, that doesn't go, and she is, yes, she's probably a little concerned for herself, too. I get that. But she's really concerned for you, too, that you not be laughed at. We can have opinions that are for the good of others, and that's not judgmentalism. But there are times where we try to find fault with other people and what they say and what they do because it just makes us feel better. Or about our cause or who we are. last two months I've had to turn off MSNBC and I've had to turn off Fox News. I just can't, I can't, I can't handle it anymore sometimes. I mean, the judgmentalism is just out of control. It's no longer even anger. It's just flat out malice. But rather, Jesus says in these verses, not judgmentalism, but let's take a look at this. Humility. Jesus' way is different. He says that when you see a problem, listen to this, when you see a problem, a sin, an issue in a person's life, he says, go and repent. What? Yeah, you, me. First take the plank out of your own eye. See, this is the beginning of humility. This is what's interesting, is, is, is interesting to me. Wouldn't this be a shock politically? Well, it would be impossible probably. In other words, he says, first go to prayer. Sit down in God's presence and then say to the Lord, I've seen such and such in this guy or this girl, but Lord, how am I doing in that area myself? We say to somebody, as we 
talk about A, B turns to C and says, I can't believe that A said that. Be nice if C turned to B and said, you ever said that? <laughs> Put things in perspective real quick, wouldn't it? But the Bible says, if I don't even have a C to talk to, I as B, criticizing A, should go to my, the Lord before I say anything to A or anything to C or D or any other person and just say, Lord, how am I doing in that area? That's the beginning of humility. I'm not better than that person. But I'm tempted to think that I am. I've got issues that you need to deal with me that are probably far bigger than even those person's issues. Lord, help me deal with my issues. Lord, help me to grow. That's where you begin first. You take the plank out of your own eye. You see, the thing is, maybe if I realized that all of what Philip or Joe or Sally or Don or Helen or whoever the person is had to go through in their life, I'm amazed they came out as good as they did. One pastor told a story not too long ago. He said, he said I remember going on a missions trip one time. This is not my story. It's another pastor's story. But he said the assistant leader that we had on this missions trip was a young lady. He said, I'm going to call her Ellen. She was a real pain in the neck. Most of us got really fed up with her. We thought she was pushy, bossy, slimy, and rude. That's quite some adjectives there. Even for a pastor to admit that. But on the last night of our missions trip, we had a group time telling each other our life story and how we came to faith in Jesus Christ. When Ellen got up and told her story, we were rooted in our seats. She had had a difficult upbringing, lots of heartache. She had come to know Christ, but the story was horrific. When the ice melted and we realized why Ellen was like she was, a miracle happened. We started to like her. We had judged Ellen and we had formed opinions without knowing the whole story. We had not been spiritual. We had been fleshly. We were guilty of judgmentalism. The third point I want to leave you with this morning is restoration. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 2, it says, Make my joy complete, or make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and purpose. This is the goal of the Christian life. Wouldn't that be something if every church could say that? And <laughs> you know, we could raise our hands and go, hey, Paul. Oh, St. Paul. <laughs> That's us. When you look at Philippians 2 2, well, you're thinking of First Baptist. The spiritual person here is the one who's taken the plank of wood out of their own eye, the humble person. And Philippians 2.2 is just confirming what Jesus is saying right here in Matthew. First, Jesus says, take the plank out of your own eye and leave your brother alone for a moment. Now he doesn't say, just deal with yourself and then ignore what your neighbor is doing. No, he's not saying that. He's not saying... Don't be judgmental. Just be tolerant. Can't we all get along? Turn a blind eye to sin. No, that's not what Jesus is saying. He's saying, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then, listen to this, and then you will see what? Clearly. Clearly. Oh, is there power in clarification, isn't there? When you see something clearly, you remove the speck from your brother's eye. John Christendom, a man of God in the early church, once said it this way. Correct your brother or sister, not as a foe, not as an adversary, or exacting a penalty upon them, but as a physician, providing medicines, and even more as a loving brother, anxious to restore and rescue. That's what a physician does. I just had my annual checkup. And I've had my doctor for many, many years. He's a wonderful friend and once a quarter, we actually are, are so friends that we, we go out and just have dinner together and talk. And, 
and, and laugh and enjoy one another's fellowship. And I have to go to Dr. Pete, and Pete checks me over, does the whole nine yards and the whole thing, and then we talk a little bit more. But Pete has to correct some of the thinking I've had. And as I get older, <laughs> there's more correction in diet and exercise. It, it, it's overwhelming. But he's not doing that to make me feel, for him to feel better. He's prescribing whatever he needs for me, for my health, for my prosperity in life. Now, if I'm going with that attitude, if I can see clearly and I can give a proper diagnosis to someone that only comes if I'm seeing clearly and I've got the junk out of my own eye first. And he says, judgmentalism has nothing to do with it, but I'll tell you what, clarification is important. And then when you get clear on things, you can move into restoration with people. Judgmentalism can kill. It doesn't mean that you can't have an opinion. It isn't that you can't even make a judgment. Jesus isn't talking about that. He's talking about an attitude of superiority. He's talking about taking God's place in rendering the judgment on someone's life. Most often that appears, even in our theological thinking in churches tried to be kind this morning but I think every church is guilty of it John Calvin once said let us not ever come to the point where we bind B-I-N-D every man's conscience and that was said by a reformer and reform theology is anything often more than non-gracious it is rather brittle at times but you and I are the living expression of the Christian life in God. Now I can't help, I can, I can, I can hear some of you thinking, <laughs> Pastor, I can't do it. Sometimes it's too difficult. How can I go and help someone put things right? What right do I have? Well, you have God's word that gives you the right. But it's only based on the fact if you first come to God and ask, is what's wrong with my life? Where am I falling down in that area? I have a Bible study on Thursday noons. It's just made up of lawyers and judges. Interesting crowd. <laughs> we were talking a little bit about this one Bible study ago. And one of the top criminal lawyers in our city said, wow, that kind of changes the game for me during courtroom time. <laughs> I got to fight for my client. He said, but I think before I get to the courtroom, I've got to really be thinking very clearly about how this acts out before I start trying to tell the jury what's going to go on. I think sometimes that goes on in our life too when we're trying to get clear, don't we? And we go to God in prayer. We have every intention of trying to get clear on our life. But we go to God and we say, God, that, look at that person. You've got to do something about this. And I'm going to give you a week, but then I'm going to get involved. So please do something. I don't think that's what it means by clarity. I think the issue here is that we come and we say, God, where, where, where am I? Am, am I like this? Well, Norm, who comes to this Bible study, is a security guard at one of the banks downtown. He comes there, and he also doubles as a pastor on the weekends. He's an African-American guy, and I love Norm. He's just so down to earth. He kind of brings us all right down to the bottom line on things. And he said one time in a Bible study, he said, you know, he said, I used to just kind of get all upset about some of the groups that are marching today. A lot of the African-American groups that are marching it, they want this and they want that. And he said, one day I got down on my knees in front of my bed and I knelt down. He said, God, I know they're marching for this. What am I marching for? Am I right in marching for these things? And God showed me clearly that there's not a lot of difference between me and them. We're both marching. And we're demanding. And we're angry. And he said, God had to deal with my anger and my agenda and my stuff before I could see clearly how I could help them. 
That's what, that's what I'm talking about this morning. None of us have it together. None of us are perfect. Let's be clear. Most of the time, our job is simply to go and sort ourselves out. That's what we try to do every morning, I'm sure, in our quiet times. But there's time where we need to go and help our friends, too. The Scripture says that. Is one man sharp as another? That's what you should be doing. There should be times where we, we have accountability in our lives. But we can't even do accountability groups, gang. We can't even go and exhort one another unless we go with clear eyes. And we don't go in a judgmental spirit. We go with a, an attitude of humility and seeing clearly first before we can even do the restoration. And so that when we go to one another, we're going as physicians. But oftentimes we don't get past that first step. One day, Billy and Ruth Graham were driving through a long stretch of road construction. They had numerous slowdowns, detours, and stops along the way. Finally, they reached the end of that difficult and smooth road that was going to stretch out before them. A road sign caught Ruth's attention. A road sign caught Ruth's attention as they left. It said, end of construction. Thanks for your patience. She said, Billy, would you put that on my tombstone? <laughs> I got a chuckle out of that. I thought, oh, man, we really are under construction, all of us, aren't we? I will tell you something here that I think is, what I think is profound. I'm not sure it even came from me, but I think it came from Andrew Murray McShane. I think the way we stop construction is when we start to get into fleshly obedience instead of just walking in the Spirit and putting to death the deeds of the flesh. And I think for all of us on our tombstone, that's when the construction ends. And we have to tell those who are leaving, thank you for your patience with me. Some of us have adopted that old sorry. Please be patient with me. God isn't finished yet, right? Let's all remember that. Let's all remember that because the goal is still Philippians 2.2. United in spirit, intent on one purpose, developing love for one another. Take a look at this verse at the end here in Isaiah 45, 19. I publicly proclaim bold promises. I do not whisper obscurities in some dark corner. This is God speaking. <laughs> I would not have told the people of Israel to seek me if I could not be found. Can't you see it like God, are you listening up there? Are you paying attention to my prayer? No, he says, I, the Lord, speak only what is true and declare only what is right. Listen, my friend, don't get too concerned about what God hasn't said or what he might say or if he had the opportunity to say it. Go with what he has said and count on it to be true. And in the meantime, with one another, Please be patient. God isn't finished yet. And even on the tombstone of our hearts and our minds, end of construction. Thank you for your patience. May God bless you. May he keep you. May he provide this week a week of incredible strength and power as you walk with one another. May he give you eyes of understanding this week. May he give you eyes of clarity. May you walk in humility. And may you see his power ten hundredfold in your life. Amen and amen. God bless you.